members, if you could uh, take your seat. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming here. I uh, we expect others to be straggling in, so uh, but we have a full agenda, and we want to make sure that we we cover this agenda. I did want to say that uh, this is the technical committee, which uh, I believe goes until noon. And then uh, this afternoon, the steering committee will meet for the first time. And uh, I believe everybody is welcome to stay if your schedule allows so that uh, that you can, uh, can see how the steering committee functions in its first meeting. Uh, for the members of the public, there were two packets that you can pick up. and. One of them uh, is the meeting packet, and one is a working group formation packet. So I just wanted to make sure that you pick that up, because we will be talking about that a lot today. And for technical committee members, your packet should have your name on it. This is the, the one that says working group formation packet. So make sure it has your name on it, because we'll be asking you at the end to turn those in, and we want to make sure that they're representative of, of your thoughts. Um, we can go around the table now uh, and, and uh, make sure there are a few people who are new, so um, I will start. I'm Leslie Corselia. I'm one of the co-chairs of, of CASA, and I'm also the executive director of Silicon Valley and Health. Good morning, everybody. I'm Fred Blackwell. I'm one of the other co-chairs, and my day job is CEO of the San Francisco Foundation. I do know why I'm here. I'm my code review is GM Jim over Ken, your side. I'm Ken Turkey with NPC and ABEX. Jennifer Lassar, S1 on the Stock Res Facilitator. Abby Carmine, TOD Program Manager at Art. Amy Fishman, Executive Director with the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. Andreas Kluber with the Alameda County Building Trades Council. Caitlin Fox with Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Denise Kingston with TNG Partners representing the Bay Area Council. Gabriel Metcalf, Spur. Jennifer Hernandez, filling out the form already. Jennifer Martinez with Faith and Action Bay Area and Chico, California State Network. Jonathan Farr with Summer Hill Housing Group. Joseph Villarreal with the Cochabas County Housing Authority. Ken Rib, City of San Francisco. Mark Kroll, Saras Regis Group. Long lost Barry Herta, EAH Housing. Robert Apadaka, Chuck Rich Coast, Enterprise Community Partners. That's Nika Moss, Hamilton Pins. Scott Little Hale, I'm going to get California Carpenters Regional Council. Okay, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, uh, really quickly on what we want to be able to accomplish today. This will be our first day to really dive into some of the issues that we will be asking for your, your thoughts on. Uh, they are big, high impact actions, and we'll be putting a little perspective on that when we get to that. Uh, there will be no decisions that will be made today, uh, but we're kicking off the process, and a, a big outcome for us will be the formation of the, the uh, uh, subcommittees that will be, be forming to really dig into these ideas. We have uh, some celebration to do in that we, uh, for the first time in many, many years, we actually have housing bills that passed uh, the, the legislature. Uh, we have a package that's before the governor. He has a few weeks left uh, yet to sign, or about two weeks left to sign. Uh, but he has said he will sign. I think the package is a really good example of compromise because there's uh, there are things in the package for everybody to like and things that people don't like. And uh, one of, of the, the things that's clear is that it's a good first step. So we know that it doesn't do everything that we need and we want to look at what those next uh, ideas might be. I think this year is a really opportune time for us since the governor has now expressed interest in housing. It is his last year, and my hope is that this group is going to come together with some really solid legislative ideas that we can push through in the last year of this term. 
So uh, I'm, I'm really happy I've been working uh, in housing for a really, really long time. I used to work for the state and we always waited uh, and listened to the governor's speech every year. And uh, the only housing at that point that, he talked, that that governor talked about was prisons. So um, really exciting uh, to have housing as a topic of conversation in Sacramento. Uh, and uh, with that, I will um, move to my co-chairs. So um, good morning, everybody. As um, Leslie said, we don't anticipate um, today being a real high stakes meeting, um, but we do anticipate getting into some more high stakes discussions uh, as we move forward. And uh, in that spirit, we have spent a little bit of time uh, thinking about both kind of what kinds of decision making tools that we want to use uh, in order to move us through the process, as well as we want to kind of um, introduce to you how we are thinking about how the co-chairs, this committee, subcommittees, and the steering committees uh, will interrelate and make decisions as well. So in your packet, uh, you uh, should have had a memo that says cost of decision making process. And I just wanted to um, run through a part of it. Michael will run through a part of it as well. Uh, the piece that I want to really focus in on is the decision making tool uh, that's in there, which we are calling um, the gradients of agreement. Um, and really, the reason why we wanted to introduce this is because we felt like uh, as we move forward, um, the ideas that were going to be brought from the committees, uh, from the subcommittees, and from uh, different uh, areas of work um, won't necessarily uh, have a binary reaction from everybody. So it won't necessarily be, yes, I agree, no, I don't agree. Uh, and we wanted to be able to introduce a tool that allowed folks to both express when they were in strong agreement uh, with uh, some of the proposals that were coming forward, when there were very strong disagreements with the uh, um, um, uh, ideas that were coming forward, uh, but also uh, have the room to talk about how people will feel in between those two um, uh, polar opposites. And so uh, what you will see in the memo uh, on the second page are the levels of agreement um, uh, that we want to introduce and, um, and bring to you. Uh, and as you can see, um, it goes from a one uh, which means that you strongly agree with whatever proposal is in front of you or in front of the group. Uh, and the opposite end of that continuum uh, is that you object to the decision and you basically will do everything in your power to stop. It. Um, in between there, um, you know, you kind of agree with the with reservations. Uh, you know, I, I, this is something where I, I kind of think this is good, but there are elements of it that um, I'm concerned about and I hope that we might be able to work on but I don't feel strongly enough about this to try to stop the process. Say, kind of with number three, um, neutral or abstain. This is kind of, I, I don't feel very strongly positive or negative about it, and that's so I'm willing to go along with what the group uh, is, is going with. Um, four is I disagree, but I don't feel so strongly about it that I don't want to stop the process in its tracks, and then I talked about what number five is. And so when it comes to um, voting, what we're going to ask you to do uh, is really kind of quickly talk about where you are. Uh, and we're going to use that both as a way to get a feel for uh, the mood in the room and how folks are leaning towards one proposal or another, uh, but we will also use it, the co-chairs will use it uh, as a gauge to figure out whether or not we can move forward uh, and whether or not we have enough agreement in the room. Uh, in order to bring a proposal to the next level, which will be kind of throwing it over to the fence to the steering committee. Uh, and so that's how we want to um, use this. The other thing I want to say is that um, in order to kind of determine or read the room, the co-chairs are going to caucus around this stuff. So after we kind of poll you all uh, and we're able to see uh, where folks are in terms of the, the one to five uh, gradients, we will have a discussion about kind of what we are seeing and whether or not we uh, think we have enough agreement to move forward. And what we are going to use as co-chairs uh, is a consensus process. So we won't decide to move forward unless all three of us decide that it's time to move forward and that there's enough agreement in the room 
uh, to do so. So I just wanted to kind of give you that overview. Michael's going to talk a little bit about um, the, the splitting of roles and responsibilities and decision making between us, uh, the technical committee, the steering committee, uh, and the subcommittees. But I just wanted to kind of start with uh, introducing the gradients of agreement. Any questions on that? Like a bunch of these. My favorite is number four. So and, and in you case should, <laughs> you should all focus on that one. And in case you need help, a lot of that. Yeah. So. And in case you need help, we have laminated. This is one. <laughs> this is two. I was going to do that. Um, and so, see me if you need additional help. Okay. So I think um, you have a sense of what the concept is. It's, uh, this is not a plus or a minus sort of bunch of ideas. They connect to other ideas. There's, I could do those five, but I hate number six, and that's okay. There's a package there. And I think we've talked about in the past that a grand bargain is kind of what we're aiming for, that there isn't just this issue or that issue. So the, the thing I would like you to concentrate on, because it's what we're going to try to do when we get the results, is when you look at these numbers, uh, which I wasn't kidding about number four possibly being my favorite, but th there will be some of those. And what you're placeholding is, hey, listen, you know, if, if these five other things could get done, then, yeah, maybe that one's something we could throw at a grand bargain. So if you could, when you're doing these, keep those two words in mind, grand bargain and the greater good. I think that's the other concept we have you know, adapted. This is all to try to make the Bay Area better, not one segment of it. Because um, the Bay Area is our subject. This is a regional problem. You read about it every day. Today there was another article about how screwed up the housing world is. Nobody in this room needs to be told that. So um, we're going to take the steering committee uh, agenda today. We're going to go through the suggestions that have come up out of the committees. Um, we'll also ask you if you want to uh, and being a moderator of one of those committees because the three of us don't think that's appropriate for us to also moderate those committees as well. So there'll be an opportunity for you to do that or be a, an active member. Uh, so when, when we go through the items today, we'll be getting your responses to standalone items because that's not what we can ask. But when you grade them, think about them in context of something that you can see as part of a bargaining chip. So, the technical committee, I think, will be probably um, uh, hopeful that they may be easier. When we get to the steering committee, now you have uh, a different set of folks. You have mayors and politicians and folks who aren't used to the thumbs up or thumbs down uh, in the public. So we're going to try this uh, uh, with them. With the same concept. We're going to use the one to five. Uh, they are the ultimate recommending body to go to Steve's commission, the MTC commission. To say, hey, this group has come together, they wrestled with a bunch of things at the extreme, and they've got this package. It's legislative, it's financial, and they are trying to look at it as a, as a bunch. So that's where we're headed. And uh, today will be the first day we, we know this group is anxious, this group in particular, to get to the meat of the matter and let's fix some stuff. So today you're going to hear the ideas, uh, you get to respond to the ideas. As quickly as we can, success around it. That would be good and helpful. So that's my thought. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Everybody like number four? Okay, so we're going to go through. So, just to kind of introduce the next section. Um, so, again, let me say for the members of the public, the ideas are in a separate package. For the members of the technical committee, hopefully, you all have a package on your desk with your name on it. Um, can I see your package? So, I'm going to use Bob's package. So, for looking at Bob's package, uh, his name is on it. So, hopefully, your name's on it. If you have one and your name isn't on it, please write it on it. And then there are three boxes that we're going to be asking you to check. Um, one is, if you want this back at the end of the day, just check it, we'll PDF it back to everybody. The second is, if you want to be on the production committee or the protection and preservation committee, you can be on both, if you'd like to check that. And then the third thing is, if you're interested in leading one of the groups as the work group moderator, please just write 
write that down as well. Um, what we're going to do today is we're actually going to start in the back with Fred's um, piece, which starts on page 21. His team didn't get it into the action ideas template, but he's still going to go through his ideas, and we're going to ask you to write one through five next to him. And then Leslie and Mike are going to go through their ideas. They're in our template form, and you can circle them. And what we're going to do is collect all of this back, and we're going to aggregate it. But the format for the hour and 20 minutes that we have is that each co-chair is going to present their, their ideas for about 10 minutes because we really want to hear from the committee. And then we're just going to let uh, kind of have a discussion of people can weigh in. Uh, I know that, that many people have worked on their own ideas. Uh, and so that's a chance for you to, to say that you also have ideas. Um, we're going to ask that those ideas go to the appropriate committee. Um, and then at the end, we have another 20 minutes to really talk about this work group process. Um, I just want you to know it's going to be messy because we're going to see who sorts themselves into work groups, and then we're going to figure out how to organize you. Uh, and, and it's just going to take a little bit of logistics uh, to do that. Um, so any questions just on sort of how the next hour and 20 minutes works uh, before the co-chairs each start? Um, just a quick question about, so Michael kind of talked about the goal is that there'll be sort of a bundle of, yes. of, of things. And so is the idea that the work groups or, or today's discussion will think about how the combination of many of the ideas uh, how, will Thanks. equal Thanks. impact? Because yes. I, I think that's going to be really important to know how the puzzles all fit together. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that prompting question. So there are actually two guidance memos in your package. Uh, there's the gradients one, which you all see, and then there's actually a memo on the work groups. So what we envision for the work groups, and we'd like your feedback today, is that we'll aggregate all of this stuff. It'll all be public to the whole technical committee. We'll give it to both groups, and then we would ask the groups uh, and there'll be staff, so you'll have assistance to one, figure out where there's overlap. Um, and uh, so we can sort out and maybe send ideas to one group or the other. And then where there's strong agreement, so um, ones and twos or ones, twos and threes, then we'll move those ideas to an action plan and the work group will develop an action plan and bring it back to the technical committee. So we're trying to transition this committee to really having these meetings be where the work groups report back. I go. Um, where the work groups report back. And so this is a, a meeting of going through action ideas. And then where we have things that are not, uh, that don't have enough agreement, then we may have presentations and discussions to try and fine tune to get to a greater level of agreement. Um, so we envision a lot of the heavy work being done in the work groups, and then decisioning done here where we have pretty good consensus or more education and discussion on things that are really hard. Does, does that make sense to everybody? People have questions on that? If I were to answer your question, I would have said no. It's impossible for you to make a bargain not knowing what the other elements are. Today is your first chance to say, I hate X above Y. We then have to figure out, as we move this down the road, where those can balance. But today, there, there's not an ability to say, I'm willing to trade three you know, rent controls for two free housing, or whatever. Um, we can't do that today. But So today is your chance to give your honest answer as to the issues. And, uh, and we'll go from there, I think. Can you clarify uh, on, because I read in the, the preparation materials that what we're really going for is where we as a regional committee can have impact. And yet, um, in, in the forms of what we're looking at, it's where those actions can be implemented. So we as a committee can't implement state legislation or we can't stop climate change or something like that. Uh, even if we might want to. So can you speak a little bit to that issue about what is it that we're trying to get to about what we as a regional committee can have impact on? I'm happy to give it a shot. Um, it, 
if you look back to what Leslie referred to is that uh, all the items got done in the legislative uh, um, office this year or about to be done by the governor. Uh, they were done by, by work groups. They were done by Spur, Bay Area Council, other groups, political advocates, uh, meeting with those folks and controlling them to make progress and do things. Uh, Jennifer's spouse, Atkins bill, you know, those kind of things took typical political product without much financial clout in the truth sense. So this group is going to, I think, come up with you know, powerful, logical, connected solutions we believe that have legislative or financial uh, outcomes. And we'll have an MTC board that says these are our chosen few. These are the ones we're going to work on. And we will try to, as I have said, you know, utilize the carrots and or sticks that exist in an MTC environment to help motivate folks, whether it's cities to do more uh, RENA reform, whether it's uh, the governor to do, uh, we all talk about redevelopment 2.0, those kinds of things. So I think it's trying to put, this is, this is an amazing group. This is, not, there ain't another one like this. Powerful, thoughtful members. So when it comes together, and we have mayors, we have members of, of Alameda County boards, and we have Green Belt Alliance, and we have Habitat for Humanity, and we have all of that birth saying these are the five, ten, whatever we end up with issues that we are behind, and we're going to come up with a system that will help force them, so to speak giving cities incentives to do things, taking away the candy, the dumb prisoners. I think that's how I view it. I don't know if it's different than the other two pictures. Uh, no, I think that's true. I think the other thing that I would add is that a lot of people around the table are working on ideas and proposals, and this body gives us the opportunity to see where we can do things together instead of in our silos. So I think I'm hopeful that on things like funding, for example, that that a lot of people are working on funding, but how do we how might we be able to do that together in a way that, that it has a larger impact? Okay. I think we got the first round and find anything else for opportunities. So um, you know. I'll just say uh, at the top, I for one uh, have been looking forward to today so we can kind of begin to get into the nitty gritty a little bit more around um, what people's big ideas are uh, and how people are reacting to it. I think to echo uh, what Michael said a little bit earlier, I think the, the hope is that we can get to uh, a grand bargain uh, and that uh, we can find the highest common denominator across uh, different interest groups and stakeholder groups. Um, just a little bit about uh, process from our group. Um, after the last meeting, when we decided as a group we would kind of go back to our respective camps to come up with big ideas, um, Derek and Jennifer and I kind of quick had a quick caucus and uh, decided that we wanted to uh, convene. Uh, some of the equity-oriented uh, advocacy groups and community organizations and uh, community organizing groups uh, to come up with uh, some of the big ideas that really kind of uh, spoke to uh, protection and more specifically uh, the displacement and gentrification crisis as it relates to uh, the housing crisis in the Bay Area. Uh, we ended up convening uh, a group of, I would say, probably around 25 or so. Uh, people. It included um, folks who were uh, public health professionals from the public health departments around the region. Uh, it included um, uh, housing, uh, affordable housing advocacy groups. Uh, it included um, uh, groups that are doing community organizing uh, in low income communities and communities of color, not just on housing issues, but issues having to do with public safety, economic security, tenant protection, those kinds of things. Uh, we also uh, had in the room um, 
uh, policy uh, and advocacy groups that were all, have also been working uh, on these fronts as well. Uh, we got significant uh, support uh, from uh, the Six Winds Coalition, public advocates in urban habitat who uh, presented some good ideas to get us going and presented a, a really good point of departure and an organizing uh, framework for us. And so uh, what you see is the product of one three-hour meeting and a kind of a follow-up phone call. Uh, and so uh, we think that there, this is a good start in terms of what we are uh, putting on the table, but we think that there's still uh, plenty of work to do. Uh, just a little bit uh, in terms of framing for uh, you all in the room who had, weren't a part of these discussions. Um, the, there was a, a strong sense of urgency that was brought into the room around displacement issues. Uh, there was a feeling that there are uh, some very specific vulnerable communities, whether they're geographic communities, uh, racial or ethnic communities, gender, other uh, populations that are really either uh, at risk of displacement, have already been displaced, uh, and the thought was really that uh, this group uh, and its protection uh, needs to be uh, front and center uh, in terms of the work that this group does. Um, and that, in particular, just to go a step further, uh, I think the group felt that um, while production and preservation, big ideas are important, uh, and we talked about a lot of them, and we think that there are probably uh, areas uh, where there might be surprising levels of agreement on some of those things, uh, to move forward, particularly with uh, robust production ideas, without first thinking about and having a very thoughtful discussion about how to protect the folks who are uh, currently in danger of displacement or vulnerable to displacement uh, will be catastrophic for those folks who are um, uh, in that situation. So the notion of you know, production without protection we think will lead to greater levels of displacement than we're currently seeing. The other thing that I would say about it is that um, this is urgent. Uh, folks are already um, uh, experiencing this. Uh, the group felt like uh, the production uh, and preservation big ideas, at least that we were talking about and coming up with, were great but long term. Uh, and that in the meantime, uh, there are folks who are uh, experiencing and in danger of being displaced today. Uh, and so for us, that was a very uh, important organizing philosophy Protection first is one of the things that we talked a lot about in terms of uh, how this stuff needs to go forward. And I think um, you'll see uh, the, the folks who are both a part of this group and the people who uh, are watching this process from an uh, equity point of view um, kind of um, singing that drum or using that drum beat. Um, so what you see is really um, here six big ideas that we think um, really swing for the fence uh, in terms of protecting uh, existing residents. But before I go to that, I wanted to also uh, say a couple of things about goals, which you can see on the second page of our document. Uh, we came up with a protection goal of 300,000 low-income renter households. You can see in the footnotes how we came up. Uh, with that number and other numbers, but it really represents uh, some of the research that shows that that's the number of folks who are vulnerable uh, to displacement. Uh, we think that the price tag for that is probably about $400 million a year when you look at the various uh, uh, things that we're putting forward. And again, we think that that needs to be uh, thought of sequentially uh, in terms of protection uh, and then preservation and, uh, and production. Uh, you can see here the preservation goal uh, takes 66,000 plus homes occupied uh, by and uh, affordable to low income renters off of the speculative market. You can see the price tag for that. Uh, and then a production goal uh, to meet the region's need for 13 uh, new affordable uh, homes a year uh, and the price tag associated uh, with that. Um, we also had some fairly robust conversations about how we get to uh, the preservation goals and production goals, but decided 
uh, that really what we wanted to bring to you all in general, the protection uh, of big ideas. Um, starting at the top uh, of the uh, idea page, uh, the first thing that we uh, want to present to the group is the notion of adopting universal rent control and just cause protections without vacancy fee control. Um, the second uh, piece that we These are, these are the six that we will be asking you uh, to put uh, grades on, yes. The second one uh, is, uh, you know, we felt that the full repeal of Costa Hawkins was uh, um, a, a big idea that we wanted to put forward. Uh, third was adopt and fund uh, rights of free legal counsel for all low-income uh, tenants facing eviction. Uh, Fourth is the adoption of universal relocation and rental assistance. Fifth is fund, implement, and enforce and educate tenants about new protections. Uh, we think really an implementation is key. Uh, and then the last one that we have here uh, is condition transportation infrastructure funding the localities on the adoption of strong tenant protection policies. Uh, and you can see uh, associated with those um, uh, more description uh, some footnotes to kind of detail uh, why we think those are important. Uh, but those are the six protection-oriented things that we thought were important to get on the table today. So, um, you know, I'll ask uh, Derek, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add as a co-convener. I know Jennifer uh, was, wasn't able to attend our meeting uh, as well, but I wanted mm -hmm. to ask her to weigh in as well if there were things that she thought we had to, to weigh in on. Thanks, so. There we go. Thanks, Fred. Um, I won't add a ton. Um, I'll just say thank you uh, for, for convening us and, and hosting us, and I think it was a good meeting. I want to add that um, there were labor groups in the room as well. Um, and one important thing, I think, that to echo what Fred talked about in terms of the framing of this is that we have an economic model, I think, from most people in the room that is not working, not just for our folks, but for pretty much everyone. And that economic model includes housing as a driver. Um, and it also uh, includes the jobs and the everything else that makes up the people and the families in the, in, in the region. And so the people, the protection first frame, I think for us, is the approach that we're going to take to all of the policy issues. Is sort of thinking about how is X policy going to impact the human beings, their families, and their children that live right now in the Bay Area and their ability to do so in the future? And so, and I want to echo that, that I also don't think that saying protection first for the folks in the room means we won't get to production and preservation, and we do not want folks to hear that. Um, it, it, is, it is very simply about about if you are leading with the most vulnerable in our community, um, whether that is a service worker, a janitor at Apple, or a you know restaurant worker at Burger King here in San Francisco, um, if there is a Burger King, <laughs> you know, the, how do we make sure they can thrive here uh, and are still here after we make the other you know consensus moves that we probably are going to be able to make. Um, I think the other thing that I would say is that we, in terms of a grand bargain, um, you know, I think a lot about some of the structural issues like tax reform and other things that really are stuck at the state and what the Bay Area's role is in pushing that conversation. And I'd be curious in one-on-one -on -one and in this space how we think about structural issues and and the state and the and being ruthlessly opportunistic about the Bay Area's role in moving those conversations. Um, I think that's it. That's helpful, and I, I think you'll, you'll hear some of those as we go forward the rest of the day. Um, just one other thing. We, are, we uh, hope that we can actually collectively identify some of the goals, because we think that will help us get to the negotiating place of being able to determine where, what is our collective aim. Uh, that it's not actually policy, but impact, and that impact can really only be measured in the number of households that are being preserved, protected, and created in the Bay Area. So if we can get that clear, that would be also helpful. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so page 23 with the six bullets, 
what we'd just like you to do is, next to the bullet, just write the number one through five, and again, we'll tabulate them. Um, we'll also work with Fred and, and uh, Jennifer and Derek to move them into this action ideas template. Um, and Jennifer, let me just say, uh, you mentioned impact, you mentioned impact, and one of the things that the template has is measurable outcomes. So that'll come a little later in the process, probably for many of these, but measurable outcomes is a very important part uh, of, of this process. So uh, figure one through five, and, and we're doing great on time. We're at 12 minutes, so we have about eight minutes for discussion, which I will let Fred lead. Yeah, so uh, a lot of this, uh, a lot of these ideas are, 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 I think, very capable of moving the needle in a significant way, but we'll take legislation. I just want us to think about legislation through a Bay Area pilot project lens. Um, I think it's really important to recognize the vast regional differences within the state and to not think that because something may work in Oakland and Antioch, which is itself a miracle, that it would work anywhere else. And so I think piloting uh, and uh, having a, a unified kind of Bay Area uh, political consensus to see how something works would go a long way. And frankly, it would also go a long way in dealing with the very strong charges that you know the Bay Area is the biggest problem and the biggest kind of opponent of housing. And if we got our act together, there would be less of a housing crisis statewide. So stepping out saying, this is something we want to impose on ourselves on a pilot project basis without imposing it on you, would I think gain political traction in ways that um, Bay Area ideas, uh, if uh, presumptively applied statewide, would not. So just a clarifying question on adopting universal rent control. To whom would it apply? Does that mean every single apartment in the Bay Area? Like, I, I guess for me, it, it sounds broad. And so I'm, uh, as someone who owns 9,000 units of restricted housing, 100% rent controlled, uh, you know, I, I look out there and I see situations even in my own housing where I have uh, an apartment that's $500 a month restricted permanently by HUD at $500 a month for which the tenants are making double six figures. And so, so I guess I have this question about, this is pretty sweeping, and undoing cost of pocket seems very big. So are you thinking about, uh, and I get that this is, we're at the big idea phase, but if you're thinking about sweeping, I guess I have a question, because to rank these, I have to kind of want to understand what you're thinking there. Sure. Um, I'll start, um, you know, I'll ask the, the, the co-conveners to maybe weigh in. Um, first, these, these were uh, swinging for the fence. Um, uh, recommendations. Uh, I think second is what I would say is, um, you know, I don't think that we are talking about um, developments in units that are already deed restricted uh, or um, already uh, affordable by other means. Uh, I think we're uh, mostly talking about uh, multifamily uh, situations where uh, there are no current uh, controls and where folks are subject to um, significant um, unrestricted rent hikes um, that will cause displacement. Um, Fred, in a similar vein, under adult universal relocation and rental assistance. Under Mike. Oh. Similar vein in uh, adopting universal relocation and rental assistance. I mean, that seems virtually unlimited. Any further, I, again, I understand the big idea, but any further thought on that? Yeah, um, so on that one, I mean, we are really talking about, um, so I want to go back to one of the statements that I made earlier when I was framing this, which is our focus was really on the most vulnerable um, communities geographically. Uh, and uh, from an affinity uh, point of view. And so I think what we are talking about uh, in terms of universal relocation and rental assistance is um, something that is probably means tested in some way from an income point of view, uh, something that would be uh, focused in on those communities that are 
uh, most affected and most vulnerable, uh, and also um, really focused in on um, particular um, families and individuals who are really on the edge of this place. And I don't know if that answers the question, but I think that that's the general spirit. Uh, we didn't get into kind of the all the nuts and bolts, but that's the spirit with which we're bringing this stuff. But I'm wondering if I could offer a technical uh, amendment to one of your suggestions, which was, which would be to just uh, strike out in the first one without latency be control, because repealing because right now then you could move forward with everyone doing rent control and just cause. And vacancy fee control is really handled in your second bullet under the fuel and cost of offerings. And so I think if you separate that, you might get more support on number one because there is a belief that you know, this kind of rent control is really the second wave of rent control because it offers that vacancy fee control. Yeah. I don't know other folks. I Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of wanted to follow on. Uh, uh, Point that Derek made earlier uh, with regards to jobs and wages, and I think if we look at one of the major causes of displacement gentrification, it is the massive wage disparities that this new economic boom is bringing about. So, I, I'd like to see a bullet point on here that addresses um, the issue of wages. Um, you know, there's a push now for minimum wages, and there's different minimum wages around uh, different cities in the Bay Area. Um, so at a minimum, we need to have like a regional minimum wage, but you know, minimum wage is not enough. I mean, we need to really talk about uh, you know promoting and incentivizing the regional living wage to kind of help address uh, you know from, from the demand side in terms of the wages that these disparities. Yeah, I don't think that anybody in the room that we work um, with would dispute the need to um, focus in on wage issues and economic security issues. We were really kind of wanting to hone in on housing related stuff. Um, but you know, you would find uh, in our room uh, plenty of support for um, economic security uh, related stuff to be on the other side of that. Okay, I was, I was gonna say that I love that you spoke for the census. Um, I, I think that you know we are faced with a crisis or a catastrophe in states, um, and I you know I, I work for a national organization and we've been you know I've been I've been telling people nationally that this is not Seattle, it's not Boston, it's not Washington D.C. That the problems are way beyond that, and that we really need to really take huge steps. And so I love this.
need some agreement because I think it changes how willing uh, people are are uh, willing to go in terms of political and capital um, in these recommendations. Is it okay? I think let's let's shift to production because we're going to again have Leslie give about a ten minute overview, and we're going to have questions, and we're going to Mike do the same, and we're going to have questions, and then we have about twenty minutes at the end. So just hold your questions. I just want to share two things uh, thinking about legislation. One, uh, on Jennifer Hernandez's idea about pilots, I want you to know there was a pilot uh, a housing bill passed by, carried by Senator uh, Assemblyman Todd Gloria that, that allowed two housing authorities for five years to look at middle income housing production, San Diego, I believe, Santa Clara County. So pilots are, you know, in the minds of the legislature. And second, Senator Scott Wiener is at the steering committee in the beginning, and so uh, if you come to the steering committee or only stay for a short time, you might want to hear Senator Weiner talk about what happened and, and also hopefully he'll talk about how CASA can help uh, uh, really strengthen his ability to write legislation and how this group can really help him. Leslie. Okay, so uh, you'll see that you have two production groups and I'll talk to that at the end. Uh, my advisors um, are really South Bay folks and some regional, and they, they fall into the Hauser category, so housing advocates, nonprofit developers, community advocates, some regional uh, Hauser or national uh, Hausers like Enterprise, and then government, which I think is a really, really key piece of this conversation because a lot of what we want to do and accomplish requires uh, government to take action or to accept action and, and to implement. Um, even with policy, if you adopt policy, if uh, the policy is not implemented, uh, things don't move forward. So to that end, I also did bring forward these ideas for conversation at two round tables uh, with elected officials and also with housing and community development directors. Uh, to start the conversation there as well, and I'll be continuing to plug them in uh, as we move along. Uh, our focus, uh, while in some cases is very broad, was more on affordable housing and housing for the missing middle, which would be um, households that don't qualify for Linda's units that are income restricted, uh, but that are challenged to be able to live in our area just because housing is not affordable. Uh, we, so therefore, we looked at a suite of different ideas that would respond to these different uh, populations. We are missing a big piece, and we realized that once the three lists came together, and that is preservation. And uh, the protection group focused very much on the person. We focused a little bit more on something that could help with preservation, but not specifically preservation. And what I've suggested, and we'll come back to you with this, uh, is that Amy uh, Fishman and NPH did a very thoughtful process in coming together with a list of, of items, a lot of which were preservation. And I think it's a good starting point for us. I'd like to uh, suggest taking that, um, that back to both Fred's kitchen cabinet and mine and seeing if there's anything else we want to add to that, then bringing it back to this group in October, because today you'll notice it missing. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, the other thing that you'll see a little bit of is that, uh, that there's an overlap with some of Michael's ideas, and that is because uh, some of this deals with production, and that's production of everything from affordable housing up to market rate and to housing supply. And unlike Fred, we were not uh, so concise with six. I have 15 I'm gonna mention, and I have a list after that of things that, didn't, that we weren't able to include. Um, so the first one is really affordable housing funding. Um, I think that uh, what would be great is for us to come up with a, a really uh, big goal of how much money we want to try to raise uh, or that we think that we need and to figure out how uh, various pieces come together. Uh, we did do bond measures in, uh, in three, uh, and San Francisco did it before. Um, the three communities or counties this last time, I'd like to see the other counties uh, move forward as well. Uh, RENA reform. There were a few bills this year that, that nibbled at the edges of RENA, but at this point, uh, the RENA is still a planning document.
document and not an implementation document. So how do we how do we make sure that housing gets built? Uh, one of those ideas could be development appeals. This has been something that's been kicking around for a while. Do we have some sort of uh, state appeals board that helps push forward uh, development that uh, localities are not approving? Local government incentives, and I think that this is where you get into what's an incentive, what's a carrot, what's a stick. Uh, some things that we might, if we could phrase them as carrots, they could also be sticks, and uh, some of that, uh, an example of that would be FTC transportation funds of uh, tying housing production and meeting your, your arena goals to, uh, to access to transportation funds. Uh, uh, aligning state, uh, number five is aligning state and regional funding with RENA requirements. Uh, one of the things that happens is that some areas take on a very, very large or agree in the Bay Area to take on a large number of units and then the state and regional funding does not uh, go to them to help them meet those goals. So how do we align what would be state and regional policy with RENA? Uh, Fiscalization of land use, this, this is one of those big ideas. How do we re rethink uh, sales tax and property tax distribution uh, to remove the disincentives from improving new homes? In San Jose, we have a, uh, a jobs first policy because San Jose believes that it, it has too many homes and not enough jobs. How do we, uh, how do we change that? Um, revenue sharing, uh, looking at a way uh, for those jurisdictions that do not provide housing and don't want to, and maybe never will. Is there a way to to do something that um, allows them to uh, to pay? And it could be either just general revenue sharing or an idea like cap and trade, where uh, you know, people buy credits to not pay or to not build housing. Uh, we are suggesting uh, with the. With the assumed passage of AB 1505, the Palmer Fix Bill, um, we're assuming that most jurisdictions will no longer be implementing their housing impact fee ordinances. Uh, that's uh, and instead will be going back to inclusionary zoning. And uh, the idea of adopting a regional inclusionary zoning uh, a policy that provides some consistency across jurisdictions uh, is. Um, a, a way to um, to ensure that we are hitting various different income levels when we develop commercial linkage fees. Uh, what what I've heard a lot from the the uh, builders is that it's not fair for all of the responsibility to be on their shoulders, and that that others, uh, especially jobs, should also pay. So we put that one on there. Uh, to the pilot idea, um, it looking at uh, really, really uh, re bringing back redevelopment. There have been attempts. We have all of these li these little initials of EIFDs and EFDs and other things that none of them work. Um, if we're really going to bring it back, that's a huge lift to do statewide. Could we do something as a pilot? Um, looking at some uh, universal updates to building codes, and there's a whole lot of ideas that could fall in that, which would be you know, instead of parking minimums, parking maximums, uh, density minimums, or or different different things that um, that again make it easier to build. Uh, surplus land. Uh, we have some new surplus land law that most jurisdictions are not following. Uh, various reasons why they're not following it. But if we could put a little bit more. Um, uh,
are staying put. Uh, and then the last two uh, I think are really important and more than really maybe not hard, hard to do. One is uh, communications, which is really to, uh, to counter these NIMBY response with a region-wide community messaging campaign, campaign that, that, um, that we can use to raise attention and, and uh, get more support for uh, our policies and what we want to push. And then lastly, with, with MTC's uh, new role, uh, it's had a role for a while in housing, but now a much stronger role now that uh, the merger has happened. Uh, we want to ensure that MTC establishes a significant housing program uh, that um, and uh, appropriately staffs and resources that. Um, I would also add that we have other ideas worth consideration on the next page, and one of the ideas that the um, elected officials really keyed in on uh, was the first one, which was a school funding backfill, backfill. so something to help uh, because that is a concern that's raised. Uh, last night we had a, a uh, hearing until 1.30 in the morning on North Bayshore and Mountain View, and the only people who came up to support concern, or to express concerns were concerned about the schools. So, uh, so that would help elected officials with their being able to come to that, that yes answer with development. So that's our list. Any thoughts or comments? Can we add ideas? Is that too late? There just seems like a um, huge potential for investment from the private sector in affordable housing if we can further extend. I think a like carrot and mission stick would be very sensible. So there's major cities in the United States that have tax breaks for people. Um, the for profit developers who are making inclusionaries, you know, units in their properties and like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, did you say tax breaks? Yes, I did. And I'm not proud of managing 10,000 units of affordable housing. <laughs> can, can I suggest, because um, um, I know what to Leslie's and I know what's in our list, Yeah. it might make some sense to listen to the second list, which is okay, very similar. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. I think we might do that. Because yeah, there's some the overlap for sure, Leslie. <laughs> so, um, so okay, I'll give you our version. Our version was a group of for-profit, non-profit uh, building industries, for uh, and some other folks. And and I'll, I'll tell you from a macro overview, I would say our generic belief is that the law of supply and demand matters. Uh, you all have heard the stats that we had increased jobs in the area of over 500,000 since the recession, and we've permitted uh, less than 125,000 residential units. That's out of whack by about two thirds. We should be doing twice that amount, if not three times. And that's a result of a lot of things that way in the knows, whether it's local authority, whether it's CEQA uh, abuse. Concern whether it's enough money available for affordable housing, you know, all of those things are contributory. So, our generic overview is that build more, whatever the more includes, will be helpful. We'll be able to provide the missing middle the workers, the teachers, the lawyers, sorry, the, uh, the teachers, the firefighters who are you know, unable to stay in the Bay Area. You've now seen the stats that companies are now leaving, companies are now relocating future growth. So all that golden goose aspect is at risk. And uh, it's because the traffic's bad and the housing costs too much. Everybody knows that. So our general belief, our swinging for the fence, is to try to figure out ways to make more houses and more apartments for rent and for sale. So you see our first one is to expand home ownership. There are a lot of restrictions. Uh, listed there that uh, get in the way of developers providing uh, for sale uh, high density condominiums at transit. Everybody would probably put their hand up and say that seems like a good idea, but there's lots of reasons we can't do those things. So that committee, when it breaks out, will come up with the specific barriers and, and think how to uh, deal with it. But the general comment is we should expand. More ADUs, everybody's familiar with the ADU bill passed. Did you 
heard, uh, that creates an opportunity. There's more opportunity there. That that is just in the houses that are inside a house, not the house in the backyard. So there's more opportunities there. We think that's a, a, an easy easy idea to grab onto. Um, number three is expand funding for affordable housing. I mentioned that uh, same as Leslie. There are ways to do that. Whether they uh, eventually become redevelopment 2.0, we'll have to see. Uh, state and local taxes for uh, incentives, you all are familiar with the way it works. If you build a Costco, you get to keep the tax. If you build a house, you pay for it if you're in any particular city. That seems backwards to us. Costco is a regional benefit. Um, and a house in Palo Alto, Bethel Park, um, Albany, South San Jose is a, is a benefit for that community, but the community has to pay for it without the tax benefit. So we think there's an opportunity to maybe over a long period of time look at those and see if they're not uh, misaligned. <clears throat> You're all familiar, I think you've heard uh, some conversation about Massachusetts went way out there. And they said, uh, they passed the legislation in their state that said, if the cities don't do the right thing, if they don't build the housing, if they don't approve a project that's zoning compliant, and uh, with the amount of affordability that's appropriate, guess what? You don't die at the city hands. You can go to a third party uh, arbitrator who is sometimes as much a threat as anything that they might approve it, so it makes the cities more willing to do housing approvals. That's a, that's a, that would be hitting the defenses. That's an anti everything city standpoint, but it's, it's an idea. Uh, figuring out how to get more land for housing through government. Ways to, to get it into the production stock. Uh, this is an outside the fence, uh, not even inside the fence. It's uh, you know, no down zoning or moratoriums for 10 years. Let's just declare a state of emergency in the state of California that we got not enough housing by a lot. So when uh, our favorite town in Los Gatos, uh, Summer Hill, uh, and uh, Grosvenor, uh, went and he got uh, whacked upside the head several times and they finally went to court and they actually won. Um, the next words out of the city were, okay, you get yours, but now we're gonna do a moratorium. So you know, just it's just a reaction that you're gonna get when the cities don't want to do housing and they're motivated to not do housing many times because that's how they get voted in office. So there needs to be a, a, a these are these are as I said, these are some of the bigger heavy but they're worth talking about. Um, the production of housing has gotten expensive. We don't have enough laborers. We don't have enough subcontractors. Uh, they've all moved away. Uh, the cost of building, we all know, is as a much a hindrance as anything else. So we've got to figure out ways to support, whether it's uh, different ways of treating uh, PLAs, whether it's different ways of uh, uh, emphasizing production of housing that's built off-site. You're all familiar with them. They show up in a crane one day. Those are ideas. Uh, local agency best practices, so we can sort of go around and learn from uh, people that are doing it right. My favorite, I'll, I'll tell you the story of Los Angeles. Um, increasing land areas in the city, I kind of mentioned that, for more housing. Rena, uh, Leslie mentioned that. Uh, by the way, Scott Winter is all excited Establishing incentives for on-site deep restricted units. Uh, again, back to we're trying to make this work for everybody. Cost reduction. There is there is a limit to how much a city can say, well, okay, you can have your project, but you have to pay a two hundred thousand dollar hookup fee or a fifty thousand dollar park tax. All of those things just get added on, and at the end of the day, you can't build. So those are something that the cities and this agency are going to have to figure out. Uh, CEPA, Jennifer left, but uh, there are some people who misuse CEPA. And, uh, <laughs> not in the room. And uh, so we, we adopted the phrase mostly through Jennifer's research. We call it the men, not in CEPA, like that. Uh, and there are ways you can kind of move that process to where it's not such a uh, stalwart and killing everything. Which, by the way, I think in Jennifer's stats, it kills 
two thirds of what CEQA kills are public projects, public uh, works, so not even nasty developers. Uh, and this is the uh, final version of Go Big. Uh, and just say for 10 years, we're going to go let a lot of people build housing and however it comes out. So those are sort of the big ideas. What I will tell you is, uh, the one story is that when we went down to Los Angeles uh, a year or so ago uh, at the Bay Area Council to do lessons learned and best practices, they had just passed their bond measure prop down, which if you don't know it, it's the $120 billion bond measure. And <clears throat> it is intended to solve their transportation problems. Think about that phrase. So what they did was they mapped Los Angeles County and they showed all the things that weren't working. And then they did an overlay. And they showed all the fixes they could do for $120 billion. And it was extend this freeway, do that light rail, you know, connect to the airport, all the stuff, all at once. And whereas we tend to uh, ad hoc every issue, we do a $3 billion bond issue, we do an affordable housing bond issue, then you turn around and there's another one coming. Uh, there is an argument that this uh, grand bargain big fix has some legs, and it's what LA did it. God bless, they are just one big county and we're not. But it, it, there's a model that, that uh, if you take enough of these things and can make sense of them and put them in a package, we could actually give that a shot. So that's the version from the introduction crew. Now, any questions on all those who was the evening? Those were all the ones, by the way. <laughs> Just say. Right. Hi, uh, I've got a question. Uh, I had trouble both listening and trying to think about how to write. So <laughs> I'm way behind. I'm sure all of you are ahead of me. Some people do. Um, <laughs> uh, just uh, you know, being with, being with the carpenters union, uh, I wouldn't know how to rate, rank, expand housing production system without, because that's, you know, pretty huge. And, uh, and, and so, you know, be happy to hear more here or in the production group itself. But I'm just saying it's sort of difficult to rank. That sort of yeah, I, I, I think those were the intended uh, blockbusters of Joel Casa. Yeah, I, I mean, I think no description. other than the labor issues, I think one huge problem that we're seeing is a lack of planners, a lack of, lack of city planners to be able to move development forward. So, you know, is there a solution to, to bringing in more planners? It could be uh, stipends or something. I don't know. It's just an idea. Yes. All right, so just following up on the same question, Mike. Do you guys have any ideas on this number eight of say laws or changes or anything policy can do that would reduce construction costs? And I don't know, Carol, maybe this goes to you, but I, this is like one of the most important things if there's a there there. Yeah, I'll give a generic answer and uh, anybody in the room probably can give it more specific. Um, it is it is a problem that we don't have the workers, right? And that ripple effect is the contractors bid higher than they would normally, because now they can do less jobs and they ratchet up the price. And because uh, they can't get the workers. So fundamental to that is getting workers back in the market. Because it's a supply and demand thing. So that's sort of the basics of it. Um, the, Manufactured housing that occurs somewhere else, you know, by definition is cheaper. It's never been a successful mass <coughs> for long periods of time, but it's a way that uh, the carpenters union and some others are trying to think about these things. Uh, we have talked about things as radical as code changing. You know, uh, there's some pretty stringent codes out there for Title 24. You know, some projects may not make as much sense. Sound bad, but they may not really be necessary to really analyze them. So there may be some uh, some of those things. Carol, uh, you're doing a lot of work on this. Everybody knows Carol Galante. runs the Turner Center and is our prime uh, provider of uh, what we call non biased information from the university. Everybody biased. Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, wow. uh, yeah. 
Yes, so just uh, to clarify, uh, the Turner Center's role in this is to <clears throat> also provide research on any of these topics um, down the road as the groups get into it. Um, you know, what more do we need to know? Do we need to look at uh, what other cities or states have done? You know, anything that we can help with in terms of uh, putting meat on the bones of any of these ideas or clarifying um, <clears throat> some of the issues uh, that come up relative to what, what we know in both academic literature and um, best practices. So I, I would just say on the, uh, the idea of both expanding the workforce, uh, we have not done a lot of work on that, but um, I think the ideas that I've heard talked about uh, really go to the educational system and is there a way of uh, working uh, with community colleges and um, you know even high schools of you know trying to have more of a pipeline of uh, workforce coming in very early and you know and I know you know some of the apprenticeships programs uh, do that but are there ways of you know expanding and encouraging that and some of the other things Gabe um, I think the on the I think it's number. 13 on the fees uh, so you know I think we, we also are doing some work right now on what are the impact fees uh, around different jurisdictions uh, the variability of those impact fees uh, and uh, you know are they reasonable relative to what the um, fee mitigation act uh, kind of sets out in context and are there ways of thinking about uh, changing uh, both you know how new development is always feed to death, and uh, you know, thinking about broader uh, sharing of uh, how that infrastructure or city services uh, get, gets paid for. So um, there are some ideas uh, that we're looking at uh, around that. Other questions? Thoughts? Questions? 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 Yeah, uh, <clears throat> if I can, if I can just jump in on the labor standards issue for this, obviously. And, and both Scott and my wheelhouse. I think we need to be careful to say if we're looking at reducing construction costs by reduction of labor standards, it's a very dangerous road to go down because then you're adding to the affordable housing crisis by the destruction of good uh, uh, middle class jobs in construction. Uh, a good example of that is what happened recently in Berkeley. There was a proposal to build homeless shelters uh, with modular units that were built in China. Uh, that's a ridiculous idea fought that and now we're actually partnering with the city uh, to continue a program of providing uh, uh, housing for the homeless that's built with the union labor. So I think we need to be very careful about that. With regards to the labor supply, I think a very good avenue that we've been doing, I think across the Bay Area, is through community workforce agreements, really reaching out and working with a lot of disadvantaged communities and non-traditional populations to get them into the construction field to expand the pool of labor. We've done so at least in Alameda County with great success. I don't know that's been happening with, with other uh, uh, other areas in the Bay Area as well too. So I think there's some real good solutions that we can use to address those issues without reduction of labor standards on the construction of housing. I'll be honest, I have another fence that was working out of my mouth.
um, and it looks like some of the solutions uh, believe that we live in a in, in a a bubble where uh, you can do something that will, um, you know, cause uh, funding to stop or production to stop. I think all this is very complex, but I think you have to have a practical overlay uh, when you look at all these problems. And you just, you have to look at it beyond your narrow focus to see, you know, solving the big problems. Yeah, that, that's our job. And I also, I have to tell you my favorite word <laughs> I think we could probably come up with some ways to, you know, you can, by, by definition, it doesn't have to be perfect. By definition, it doesn't have to be, you know, <coughs> curing a disease. It's, it's a pilot program. And if it gets us some production, if it gets us some affordability, if it gets us some homeless shelters, whatever it is, um, it just, to me, seems like it's got a better sound and when people in Sacramento are approving things. I'd just like to uh, tease out Leslie number 12 and surplus land a little bit and, and, and have it also include public land. And you've kind of got carrots and sticks all mixed together in there. As Bart and BTA have put 450 acres of land on the table, I'd like us to think bigger about it. Uh, how can we help community colleges to have joint use facilities, not just be considering their surplus property? How can we provide agencies with the technical tools we need to build when they don't have those resources? Um, and, and maybe also, I mean, we're willing to, you know, go much more dense than a lot of cities are willing to do a lot less parking. And, and so, so adding into that, not just the affordable housing production component, but also the catalytic component that public land can play. Um, this is a specific to the, uh, this particular list, but in general, how should we be adding new ideas or gaps that we're identifying along the way and go ranking our voting on those? <laughs> I think that that's, that's what we'll do in the, in the work groups. Um, uh, you know, if you want to take liberties and, you know, write ideas down on the bottom, we can start to um, capture them. Um, but we'll, we'll do a lot of that in the work groups. So these are meant to be sort of the starting points of the conversation um, to just get us talking together. About the work groups. I mean, if we're all going to get into work groups where everybody in the room thinks just like you do, um, we're not going to solve anything. I mean, if you're going to talk and there's nobody who's going to disagree with you, um, I, don't think, I don't think we know who's going to be. Well, I'm just saying as we you're as right. we start to you're look right. at work groups, right. um, I would just say to people, even though it may not be your first choice to get into a, a room with people that don't necessarily agree with you, if we're really looking at trying to get things fixed, we're going to have to do that. That's great. That's great. Just to, to emphasize that, I mean, we talked about that at the last technical um, committee meeting uh, and decided that we were going to go back to our respective corners and come up with good ideas to bring back. Um, but I, for one, actually feel strongly uh, that we actually do have to form work groups that cut across um, areas of interest that I think the best be only way we're going to get to a grand bargain. I think you all mentioned this, so this isn't anything new, but I would really, it's probably the hardest thing, but I would really endorse pushing, especially at the steering committee level, regional know you've all said why it's so hard but until we can make a dent there and if it means being going Massachusetts word or whatever uh, you know some of you have seen the comments for example from elected officials in Marin County where they literally say we should be exempt from building any housing on Mary I'm sure you have some thoughts on that <laughs> I, I found that truly astonishing um, but also can be in any event we certainly endorse efforts to push upstream on, on that issue because it's really important. Yeah. We did successfully do by AA, I believe it was the same thing, and it took all nine counties to impose a property tax on themselves. And we got done. Well, it can be done. Uh, I'm not 
a lot of these, there are some fantastic ideas in here, and I love that um, the last set is a little harder for me to rank because there's no question there's a supply issue and supply is critical. And you said that's really what you focus on. Um, and incentives to increase supply, and I guess I would kind of add a phrase of, at the end of half of them that says, and even more incentive to create affordable housing. <coughs> That makes me rank them higher, I guess. Have at it. Yeah, no, we, we, we were trying to be less distinguished in of the types to at least get started. We just believe more housing is better. And the affordable housing will fall with the amount of money that we can create to support affordable housing. And the for profit housing will come out of whatever we can get legislation to help get built. So they all sort of come out I just wanted to um, emphasize something that I think Jennifer said earlier, which is trying to not get caught up in the policy and try to focus on the impact. Because um, one of the things that is sort of pervasive, I think, in production is that perhaps there's agreement on is uh, time, like the, how much time it actually takes to either build it how much time it takes to resolve conflict and process, how much time it takes. So I wonder if there's, um, you know, if, if we're able to sort of focus on the impact that we're trying to have, that there's an overlay of these types of things. So, you know, I think Andreas talked about how, um, you know, the project that, that Labor opposed around the homelessness um, shelter in the modular units, um, figuring out ways to sort of work in it advance uh, before you have to oppose because that actually delays production that that delays bringing housing to market for homeless folks when see so i just want to make sure that that's a a piece of how we uh evaluate some of these production impacts uh and recognize that each of the policy implications uh is both a process time suck as well as a delivering actual units to the market time suck so um, one of the things that we've done in our work, and it also parallels some of the work in California Forward, is to actually develop an evaluation tool. So we can kind of sort ideas, uh, strong ideas from weaker ideas, and, and that's something that we could talk about in the work group. So for example, the evaluation tool looks at um, agency competency and political viability and community opposition, so that if we have 50 ideas in a group, we might have a just a screen tool to begin to sort through them. And so, you know, again, if the work groups want something like that, I know Denise has worked a little bit on it, Jeff Fernandez at California Forward, we've done it, our work for LA County, but we can begin, Carol's got a whole bunch of evaluation tools. So I think we could, we could create some of those screens uh, that would be very tailored to the area. Uh, I want to relate back to Tamika's comment at the beginning about how the measures don't go alone. They have to go as a package, and it's really tough. So I found that with the Michael's list, uh, many of them, I was like, that's great, but it depends if there's anti-displacement provisions, or uh, that is a good idea only if these other aspects of it are in place, because with every action there is a, a result and there are intended and unintended consequences so i think that those each piece has a larger part of the, the there's more to talk about um, yeah, no, in no, terms of the anti-displacement you know, that's what we're kind of trying yeah, to say yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're kind of voting you're not voting for a package you're voting for the, the guts of an idea you could be really against some of them no matter what or you could be, uh, maybe, that's okay. That's okay. So the second thing that I wanted to say uh, as well is, well, two more things. One is I, I want to echo what Leslie said before. I think there's a lot more to be done around preservation issues. There's a lot of gaps here and a lot of great ideas we, that I'm sure a lot of us have so we can integrate those. And they do, some of them fall into more of the production, some of them fall more into the protection side. Uh, so however you want to structure that. And the last thing I wanted to say is um, we had a process of bringing together NPH members, 
really great discussions. And one of the concepts that came out of our working group that we had, which I think was a very useful tool, was the idea that we're in a catastrophe. And yes, we have Puerto Rico and Texas and Florida and the islands and, and on our mind right now. But it's what is the emergency response in a catastrophe? And so the number one issue is you focus on the people and, and keep people in place and stabilize people with their immediate needs. The second thing is around preservation, what exists. And then the third is how do we how do we build and grow beyond that? And they are all sequenced at the same time because you have you have to work on them all at the same time. But with that framework, that structure, it really brings to the forefront the immediacy and the urgency of what does it take to respond to a crisis. And so the idea of flipping that conversation to that sequencing of preser uh, uh, protections, preservations, production, uh, I think would be very useful for this group as well. well. Let me just interject to say it's 1106 and 1115. We do have public comment, and I think we want to be um, want to do that exactly at 11.15, so we have about seven, eight more minutes before we sort of shift. Uh, and one question, Jennifer, on that. Do we have any more we need to talk about about the subcommittees or any more pieces of this? Yeah, we probably, uh, we probably ought to maybe take one or two more comments and have a, a few minutes of conversation about the, the work groups. Okay, so we have Linda Metz and Scott, and we have two others, uh, Jennifer and Denise. Jennifer. So is that okay? we'll take four more people and I'll take a few minutes to talk about the work groups. Okay. Um, so this is Linda. I, I want to vote one for everything on everybody's list, right? Yeah. And, and, and so I, I, am, um, I, I want to just say that it took 10 years to get the package that we got this week. Hopefully the governor's going to sign most of it. And I, I really think you should be looking at um, near-term stuff that we could do, that we could all get our heads around that would help move the beat around some of these things. And, and you know, Cosmo Hawkins, great. That's a long conversation, maybe a five-year effort, right? So, so to the point uh, that Tariq was making about how would we do this? So I would look at things um, like the bridge tolls, right? That legislation is done with time by the governor to enhance the bridge tolls. How do we look at that which we've just accomplished in S R two to maybe get some of these things done around planning for AUs or planning for more housing? And, and I feel like we're going to be to hash this out with near, mid, and long term because some of this stuff is another 10 years with the California legislature and all of us at the table with our own special agendas. And so I, I really feel like you have to think about that very specifically. How do we make it as local as we can, get as many pilots, uh, and really try to prioritize how do we move the meter on the big victory we just had? Because that, I mean, Ann Silverberg from Bridge wrote her thesis on that. She's now the executive vice president of the bridge, right? So, so getting some of these resources taking a very long time. So, so I would just caution that we should be really thoughtful about short, near, and long term so that, that we really get results. Because I really don't want to come here 10 years from now and have us still talking about the catastrophe. So. So my point, I'm, I'm going to stick a pin in the issues of uh, worker supply for the, for the production of the public for that because I have a very different analysis after having looked at it for 14 years. It's a productivity problem, not just a non-availability of worker problem. And that goes to skills training. Uh, the, the key point that I thought was missing, and I, and I would encourage the, uh, the co-chairs to consider who are interested in the production group, is uh, timing of that takes for finance and underwriting is, is missing. And one, one of my key findings from researching the low-income housing tax credit markets over, over a 10-year stretch was that, that uh, pri prices just rise and boom in a big way, and to the degree to which we can we can figure out financing instruments, either it's whether it's through uh, pilot legislation at the state, working with CHAFA, working with other entities to try to think creatively about how to enable faster, first enable financing and enable faster financing during downturns. We can save money, we can put people to work, we can put people in housing. And at, and at lower costs all around. So I wanted to put raise that as a potential issue for the production group to, to be considering. Um, I was on the production group, and I just wanted to echo a lot of what's been said and indicate that although the production group talked about the production 
we fully understand that preservation and protection are part of the bargain, that what comes out of this group will include all three. And I think most of us are ready to engage. Um, I had, you know, 99% ones on ideas in here, and I think where the disagreement, I think Tamika said the doubles in the details, that's where we're gonna find disagreement is in the details, and that's what we're gonna have to go work on. But I, there's a remarkable commonality in this room of the understanding of the problem. Catastrophe is, is, a, is almost an understatement, sadly, and, and a tremendous willingness to move forward. But it's going to mean reaching across political divides that most of us have lived through most of our careers. And so we're going to reach across and shake hands and start talking to each other in this room and outside of this room because we must. And, and the production group is as committed to that, I think, as everyone else in the room. I just wanted to make that clear. I'll pass. Okay, so let me just, uh, again, because I'm mindful of time, there are four things that we need on top of your package, and I noticed that not everybody has a package with their name on them. So I uh, apologize for that. The first thing we need on the top of your package is your name. Um, the second is if you want to be in the production workshop. The third is if you want to be in the protection workshop, which for the time being, we're going to put preservation there, recognizing that it's going to come up in both, and we will reconcile that. And the fourth thing is if you're interested in being the, the kind of coordinator moderator of either of these groups, and we're thinking one to two moderators for each group. Um, and what we're going to ask at the end of the day is you uh, hand us or leave the package at your desk. We're going to collect them. And the last thing is if you want a copy of your own package back as a PDF, we will do that for you. So those are the five things we need. Everybody have that. Um, I just want to say one last thing, which is, you know, there is a guiding memo in here on the work groups. It's just a start. Uh, Mark, to your point, it, it, it emphasizes that we really want the groups to be mixed. Um, and we can, once we get into the groups, really work on developing the tools, taking the template, building them out, et cetera, and adding a lot more meat to the bones, uh, recognizing how complex it is. Um, Co-chairs, uh, before we go to public comment, any wrap-up comments? There's just one issue I want to raise on the um, working groups that I just want to make sure there's clarity on. Our proposal was to launch two groups, right. one on production, one on um, protection, and the preservation would be taken up by both of them. And so I just wanted to make sure that was clear um, with everyone and agreed to. I'll, I'll just make this one comment. Uh, in addition to the greater good and all that little stuff about grant parking. Also, this is an opportunity to pledge allegiance to perfection is the enemy of the good. We are not going to get to perfection. We are aiming for good. So if we come up with good bills, good policies, good activity, and as the said, if we get them done, that's a, that's a home run. So we're trying to get good packages the second is, you probably heard the same thing I did, um, and Denise tried to talk about it. I think we had silos in here today, because we do, we have silos. And the silos are defensive and supportive of their silo, whether it's production or anything. All, all of, I heard silos, because as I said, that's the nature of what we put in the room. This won't get solved if we stay in the silos. you got to get out of your silos. We, we are, and if you feel like your only job is to protect your turf, whatever your turf, production, for sale, for rent, affordable, uh, equity, union, non-union, whatever those are, this group will struggle to come to consensus. And our goal for the chairs is to get as close to consensus as it's feasible. Uh, and as I jokingly said, but maybe it wasn't, it was number four maybe the avenue of best so, you know, I don't like this, but when it's done, I will see the better for the region because, folks, it ain't working. That's all we have. How's it working? It ain't. So we got to change it. And whatever that means, this group's going to have to come together at the end of the day. And uh, Fred's going to have to pull it all together. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's all I want to say. So I keep saying that constantly. You have to believe it in your, in your
as uh, Amy and others uh, talked about, uh, this reflects the appropriate sequence of actions. It talks about, it addresses the catastrophe for people today before talking about like, longer term strategies such as protection that will take, will take years to implement. And this lifts up strategies um, such as the right to legal counsel, rental assistance and relocation location assistance for low-income tenants who are facing eviction, universal rent control and just cause, repealing cost of Hawkins, and conditioning transportation infrastructure funding on the adoption of anti-displacement policies. There seems to be broad support for uh, leading with the protection framework first, and so I'd urge the committee to formally adopt that. Hello, good morning. My name is Michelle Majid. I'm here with Urban Habitat and the Six Wins for Social Equity uh, Network. Um, this remains an issue of uneven distribution of resources made worse by trickle-down theories and a myth of scarcity. Today, the same cities whose exclusionary zoning, redlining, and housing covenants disenfranchise communities of color are now advancing policies to revitalize blighted areas, deepening gentrification pressures in the process. Um, Communities are growing poor in place and are being priced out of the Bay Area. The same people who use abstract language where housing is imagined as units, not homes with people living in them, make it easier to accept eviction than treat people as a secondary problem. It's clear to those of us who are directly impacted that we're facing not just a market failure, but a deeper moral failure. Dis displacement separates people from their jobs and schools, forces low-income transit riders to switch to polluting cars, results in added congestion and impossible commutes, contributes to homelessness, creates health problems, and destroys community networks. Tenants and advocates are sharing strategies and advancing policies like rent control and just cause for eviction to challenge the belief that we can build our way out of this crisis. According to a recent Berkeley Institute for Governmental Studies poll, 48% of California voters described housing, unaffordab housing unaffordability as an extremely serious problem with 56% considering relocation and 60% in favor of policies like rent control. That's 63% in the Bay Area. Protecting people first can actually save local governments millions of dollars and at a minimum they are cost neutral since they pay for themselves through city administered fees. As one example, New York City recently adopted a universal right to count legal counsel in eviction proceedings. An independent study found that this policy would actually save the city between 100 to over $300 million per year. Lastly, I want to lift up the three P goals as presented by Fred earlier, starting with protection first. Thank you. Okay, next up is Pat Eklund, and after Pat is David Sisser. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pat Eklund, and I'm an elected official with the city of Novato. Michael, it's good to see you again. Um, I was not going to say anything today, but I could not let Bill's comment go without a response. That comment is furthest from the truth, and I am urging this committee not to make judgments on specific localities um, with, uh, based on hearsay, but look at the facts. The city of Novato, we used 100% of our redevelopment money, and Michael knows about this, to build 600 affordable housing units in our town. Uh, 300 ownership, 300 rental. We've done a lot more than that. We've done more than a lot of cities uh, throughout the Bay Area. Um, there's no question that there's a housing crisis, but all of us has a responsibility, not only cities and counties, but also the special districts. Schools own property. They should build housing for their teachers and administrators on their property. Water districts, sanitary districts, um, uh, all the special districts, college districts. There's a lot of land out there that is dedicated for other purposes where you could possibly build worker housing. Um, also, business has a responsibility. I'm a firm believer that business, if they're going to create jobs, they have to build housing for their employees. And, you know, I look at the Google site, and I've toured it. Why didn't they add a different uh, layer or two of housing for the people who work there? So that they didn't have to commute two or three hour, uh, hours. Um, I totally agree with um, Steve Levy's comment about carrots and not sticks. We need some tools. I'm running for re-election this year. And I 
have been on the city council for 22 years. I have never seen as many <coughs> vacant homes that are just sitting there than I have over the past two decades. Why is that? That's because mom and dad passed and the kids are living elsewhere, they want to hold on to the house. So I go down to the assessor's office to find other contact information. We have no tools to do it, so I'm contacting them as an elected official trying to convince them to rent that house. We have no tools. So um, I have other ideas. We need incentives to keep affordable housing units. Those 600 affordable housing units, I'm sorry, Michael, but on a split vote on a city council, and I was to know, we lost some of those because of the downturn in the economy. And so it costs us money in order to manage those housing units. And there's no incentive for cities to keep those because once you count them, that's it. But it's a huge uh, responsibility on our part. So I have other ideas, um, but you know, fundamentally this whole CASA process, this is my first meeting, I'm gonna attend the steering committee, but what I can see right now is that there's a fundamental flaw. And the fundamental flaw is most of the 101 cities of the Bay Area are not the big cities. They're the small in the middle. Where are they? Where are they around this table? I see a planner or two, but you have no elected officials. You know, and I have a lot of passion for affordable housing, Nevada has. And um, I just really wish that people would not be judgmental, look at the facts, and really think about the practical aspect of implementing this. <coughs> Thank you very much for giving me a little bit more extra time. Since I got the good side of that story, uh, I'll just comment briefly. Uh, uh, that was like drinking out of fire. I was saying that, that was great ideas. Um, come to the steering committee. That's where the, the electives are. Uh, so this is it's the type still of not the small medium. Yes, it's in proportion. Sorry. That's okay. I'll talk to you offline. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, there are small cities in here, uh, uh, from your county uh, at the street. So anyway, um, Bill, I will share his uh, just to get him off the hook a little bit. That was the image that came out. Maybe wrong, but the image was that cat said. So we should deal with that, but right? you should blame the owner with sort of the public sphere that said that's what they believe was. So we'll, we'll deal with that. But thank you for doing this, and you should come call me. All right, I'm David Zisser um, at Public Advocates, uh, which is a member of the Six Women's Network, as many people know. I want to talk about process a little bit, and I hope that's not too boring. Um, my colleague is passing out a, a handout um, on some asks that the Six Winds has. It's kind of a reiteration of, of an email that we had sent out um, before and, and kind of gets a little bit more specific. But basically, um, you know, in order to really facilitate participation um, from the public, from advocates, from community-based organizations, simple things like we need to see materials ahead of the meetings. Um, we, we didn't, I don't, I don't think anyone saw the materials out of the meetings. Uh, we need to see agendas well enough advanced so that we can prepare for those. If we need to bring residents who have a stake in this, we need to let them know that it's worth their time. And that's hard to do with just a few days of advance notice. Um, we would like to see a dedicated community meeting to hear from impacted community members um, before we uh, agree on a grand bargain. Um, we want to hear we want you to hear people's personal experiences before you decide on policy. Um, that could be done through a regional forum, it could be done at one of these meetings, one of the steering committee meetings. Um, we really want to encourage uh, cost of invite experts to speak to the committees. I know there's a lot of disagreement about facts and myths and misunderstandings and biases around different policies and hopefully an objective third party um, can come and speak to some of that. And then um, I just want to end by talking about the work groups real quickly. Um, the six months feels pretty strongly that we need three work groups. Um, uh, it sounds like there's agreement on protection and production. Uh, I've been diving a little bit into the preservation work. Um, Rich has, uh, is doing some of that. There are others who have experienced some preservation. And those who do know that it's highly technical, highly wonky, very finance oriented, 
And the folks who are interested in tenant protections are not going to engage in that. And if it's subsumed in production, production's going to take over. You're going to lose out on a, a key set of, of strategies. And, and lastly, on, on that note, because there's a lot of expertise around this table, but there's also a lot of expertise not on this table, and we think that the work groups are an opportunity to open that up and get expertise from other, other parties that are interested in this process. Next, uh, <clears throat> the next speaker is Fernando Marti, and the last speaker is Tim Frank. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fernando Marti. I'm with the San Francisco Council of Community Housing Organizations and also a member of the Six Wins for Equity Network. Uh, so I want to reiterate uh, some of the things that folks have said about the importance of putting displacement front and center in this discussion. Uh, Michael mentioned uh, that we don't want to get caught up in our silos. We're very protective about our silos. Um, Leslie mentioned at the beginning having heard from folks about the importance of putting people in that then was followed by talking about units, and both are important, right? Both are important. That people are being displaced now, and there is an urgency about that that has to be addressed. Um, I think one of the things that's really great about this process is that you have the urban displacement project from UC Berkeley that has been very carefully mapping those census tracts, those neighborhoods that are at highest risk of gentrification. Those are the neighborhoods that are primarily low income, that are primarily where our ethnic communities, where our Latino and black communities are located. And if you map those over the old redlining maps, they are exactly the same maps. So what we are saying is we need to correct historical inequities and we need to do that with a sense of urgency. One of the things that we pointed out in, in our piece, uh, working with Fred, is the amount of money and the kinds of policies. Um, I haven't heard with this group much discussion about what it will take, except Michael mentioning Prop M in Los Angeles, $120 billion over four decades. As we looked at what it would take to do real tenant protections, real right to counsel, real relocation, and I'll give an example of what that would look like, the west side of East Palo Alto, right next to Palo Alto, has been bought up by one large rental developer. Facebook, meanwhile, is trying to make its, its workers live in proximity, which is a great thing. What do you think is going to happen to those people who are living right next to Palo Alto, very close to Facebook, who are renters, even though there is rent control in East Palo Alto, when those buildings are torn down, demolished, and rebuilt for market rate housing? Are those tenants going to be able to stay in place? Are they going to be relocated? Um, where will they go, right? So those are the questions, and we have the data where those neighborhoods are that we need to serve. There's about 300,000 people in those neighborhoods. So we came up with a number, half a billion dollars a year. We came up with a number for preservation, because preservation is just as important, half a billion dollars a year. And we came up with a number to reach arena goals for new production, $1.5 billion. So $2.5 billion a year sounds pretty, pretty fantastic, but Michael has set forth for us uh, the example of Prop M in Los Angeles. So can we do, over the next 10 years, $25 billion to meet that need? And if we don't, what we are going to see is a segregated Bay Area where the poor are all relegated to the periphery and only the rich can live nearby with some affordable housing as little pockets within that. And that we cannot have. And this, I think, is the challenge for this group. Thank you. Okay, last, <coughs> excuse me, last speaker, Tim Frank. Thank you very much. I'm Tim Frank. I'm the director of the Center for Sustainable Neighborhoods. And uh, I'd like to uh, comment on a couple of things, starting with um, a little bit of a historical perspective. If you look at housing production back in the 50s and 60s, we were actually producing housing with uh, skilled and trained workers. And more than 50% of the uh, construction workforce was actually unionized. And yet at the same time, we actually were building at a much faster pace than we are right now. And we had a much larger investment of public dollars in uh, affordable housing. And those are really things that I think that we can uh, aspire to uh, getting back to in the future. There's no reason why we can't recreate that. that uh, the second point I wanted to address is the perspective of this particular point in time. Why are we here? 
year. We actually had an extraordinarily deep real estate recession. This is the second time in a century when this has happened. And the result of it was actually relatively predictable, which is we decimated the construction workforce. Um, and we need to rebuild that. We need to rebuild the, the cadre of skilled workers. But more importantly, we actually need to build the cadre of skilled foremen and the skilled managers. If you look at actual construction wages, you'll find that they have risen uh, in the past five years, but they have not risen as fast as the pace of uh, bid prices. And the reason is that the, uh, we don't have enough contractors, enough people to actually run those workers out there. And as a con consequence, contractors are able to uh, demand a surplus and get it. And there's no way we're going to solve this without intervening and making sure that we build uh, a strong cadre of, of uh, skilled uh, contractors, uh, I mean, uh, foremen and, and, and managers, et cetera. So we're going to have to address that. The final point I want to uh, address in my last 20 seconds is, the, is the looking for opportunities to find, essentially, uh, uh, free, free value. And one of those is in looking at density around, and around the, uh, the region. Our housing element requires jurisdictions to zone at minimum densities that will make some uh, multifamily housing uh, affordable or, or it make it pencil. But what we aren't asking jurisdictions to do is to evaluate what the optimum density is to actually allow for housing to be built at the lowest per unit cost. And if we actually ask people to do that evaluation or else provide that on a regional basis to people, I think it would help inform local discussions in, in a very productive way. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, that does it for the public comment this morning. We're going to move to the next item, which I'm going to introduce. Uh, this is related to something that we expected would be a part of the cost of process moving forward. It's actually being uh, brought to you in a kind of pilot uh, way because of an opportunity. Uh, the relative near term that will be before the commission related to SB1. The topic is how might, given the kind of permanent housing crisis in the Bay Area, how might MPC going forward do business differently? Uh, we've done some initial uh, programs or projects such as the One Bay Area Grant where we have conditioned transportation funding for housing outcomes. And to be clear, what we're not talking about today is using transportation funding to pay for housing. We're talking about transportation funding being conditioned in a way that would support housing outcomes, more housing production, uh, particularly for very low, low and moderate income households in the region. So my counterpart, Ian Richmond from uh, Programming and Allocations at MPC is going to walk us through the presentation. Thanks, Ken. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ann Richmond, the Director of Programming and Allocations here at MTC. Uh, I oversee many of the region's transportation funding programs uh, that come through MTC. Um, so as Ken said, uh, we'll be talking a little bit and hopefully quickly about sort of general approaches to transportation funding and its relationship to housing, and then kind of a specific policy idea to bounce off you all. Um, so far, the MTC Commission has largely focused on two types of housing support, very limited direct investment in housing, and conditioning transportation funding on housing-related actions. So this slide shows one of those rare examples where we were able to do direct investment. And this was part of the what's called the One Bay Area Grant Program, which is one of MTC's signature programs to invest federal transportation dollars throughout the region, supporting local and regional projects. For the most recent cycle of OBAG, as we fondly call it, the Commission directed about 3% of the funds, or $28 million, to direct investments in the form of planning grants in priority development areas to develop plans, zoning, et cetera, and in the NOAA program, which focuses on preservation of existing low-income housing stock. We are not able to do this kind of direct investment with most transportation funds because they are restricted to transportation projects, um, but we found a little slice of this pie that uh, afforded us this op opportunity. What we are more often able to do or uh, have more opportunity to do is to incentivize housing-related actions through transportation investments. So this slide shows that same OBAG program, but the dark blue slice in this view is the funding that's conditioned on housing-related factors. 
And that is about 45% of this program, or over $400 million. Some of those factors included the kinds of things that you've been discussing today. Um, for example, basing a formula on funding, um, partly on RENA allocations, particularly focused on low and very low income RENA. Um, basing eligibility for funding on a set of housing related factors, such as having an approved housing element, submitting annual reports to the state HCD, having adopted a surplus lands act resolution consistent with state laws, um, giving priority to jurisdictions that have anti-displacement policies. Additionally, $30 million of this funding was set aside for a challenge grant, this 80 by 2020 program, with that funding going to the top 10 jurisdictions that permit the most housing, that produce the most housing between 2016 and 2022. So that's a kind of prospective challenge program. Sorry, there we go. Um, so these funds still have to be used for transportation purposes, but in various ways they're conditioned on housing performance. And the commission adopted this policy last year. Uh, I mentioned permitting as one of the factors for OBAG, and this slide shows permits issued by county over um, the RENA cycles three and cycle four, which is about 1999 to 2014, and then I think we have a little bit of the 2015 data here as well. So you'll see that deep valley that bottoms out in about 2009 and 10 that dominated RENA cycle four. Obviously, that was the recession. Um, and it's just worth mentioning that in OBAG, when we're looking at RENA data, we were using the cycle three and four data to account for these swings over time. So that's kind of a, the kind of thing that we've been considering as we talk about these housing factors. So just to further set the stage, um, MTC has many sources of transportation funding within our purview. They each have their own purposes and requirements depending on where they come from and who they're going to. This chart shows some of the more promising potential sources to consider for leveraging with housing conditions. These are considered the best fit because they typically go to local jurisdictions as opposed to say transit operators, which generally have less land use control, and because they're fairly sizable. So the OBAG funds that I was just mentioning are shown in blue on this chart. The large bar to the left of OBAG is local streets and roads maintenance funding that goes directly from the state to local jurisdictions. These don't actually pass through MTC. They're included on this chart because they are very significant and they actually became even more significant in terms of the amount with the recent passage of Senate Bill 1, the gas tax increase. Um, so the state did not put any conditions on these funds, so whether you consider that an opportunity or a missed opportunity, I guess, is for discussion. Um, just to the right of the OBAG bar is, local, um, is the STIP, which is the State Transportation Improvement Program. This is another program that was recently bolstered by Senate Bill 1, and MTC does actually approve the program of projects for the region funded by this program. The county congestion management agencies generally do the project selection, and projects also have to be approved by the California Transportation Commission. So there's a lot of process here. But the reason that I'm focusing on the STIP is because uh, we are right now in the middle of developing the STIP program. The California Transportation Commission, or CTC, just approved statewide guidelines in August. We're planning to bring our guidelines to the commission in October, and project recommendations from the region are due to the state by mid-December. So this is an opportunity happening right now. So given your mission and the approach that I uh, mentioned for the One Bay Area Grant Program, we have two questions currently on the table before you for the STIP, and hopefully there's time to get a bit of feedback from you all. So the first question is, should MTC increase the funding pool to be awarded to jurisdictions with the best performance in housing production, permitting, or streamlining from 2015 to 2020? So this is akin to that 80 by 2020 challenge that I mentioned previously. It would be a reward type approach. Um, the funds would still have to be used for transportation, but they could go to jurisdictions with the best housing performance. 
The second question is more of a stick than a carrot, and this is, should MTC withhold funding from jurisdictions that are producing less than a specified percentage of their arena allocations for low, very low, and moderate income housing. So this uh, would be similar to some of the eligibility requirements in OBAG, um, but a little more um, sort of a, a I guess a, a funding um, stick, for lack of a better term. Um, so both approaches are not direct investments in housing because the funds are restricted to transportation uses only, but they are two different ways to kind of get at this issue. So we're interested in your feedback on these approaches in general and in particular for the STIP, uh, which is the opportunity that's before us right now, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hi there. So um, in general, I'm for sticks and carrots. Um, a couple comments on, on, on this. As with OBAG, I think we've really got to look at both labor standards and anti-displacement protections as part of the sticks and carrots. Um, the second thing I just want to like raise for all of us, uh, small cities who aren't producing have, it is, it, is, it is true at the same time that we need them to build. At the same time, it is true that they have constituencies that will vote them out of office if we activate them. So I think it also is just something we need to keep in mind as we, as we think about how we do this work. Uh, around sticks and carrots, and it argues, Leslie, I think, for something more than a communications and marketing campaign against Nimbyism. It argues for a capacity building, organizing, and strategic approach that goes much deeper than just a communications uh, uh, approach. So. Um,
region in the current cycle has about $290 million available. Of that, we only have a slice that could be used for the carrot, and that's about $45 million. So it's not insignificant, but it's not going to It is. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, this is a really critical conversation about what tools we can employ today. Uh, and I would say, you know, my response to these questions or our thinking at NPH is that where the incentives are critical is in the small and mid-sized cities in particular who need more help to get there. Uh, the cities have a lot of urgency to build. It's really the small and mid-sized cities uh, where there's need. Yes, the larger cities have infrastructure costs that, you know, when you go dense, it, it, it is more expensive. But the incentives, I think, will, if, if we can uh, lean them in that direction. And then in terms of the sick side, it's really tough to use production as, uh, as the measure. Instead, uh, we believe that um, conditioning based on complying with housing laws, whether it's the housing element or other types of laws that we know are out there, may be a better way to uh, condition funds because you don't have the unintended consequences. Yeah, I'm gonna echo what some other folks have said. You know, personally, I, I in a previous life was a redevelopment agency administrator in local government, and REMA existed, for the, the goals were low and very low, existed at a time when cities could choose to implement a program that would fund their very low and low income units. So there was a choice when redevelopment existed because every city could create an agency and tax increment and that created subsidy for the affordable units. When redevelopment was eliminated, cities don't have access to predictable sources of funding for those low, very low income units. So personally, I think it is not a good idea to punish cities who are trying really hard to do good housing policy and through no fault of their own don't have subsidy to get the low, very low stuff to work. So I think they, but I do think they should get credit for trying. And, and I think Amy pointed out, you know, compliance with housing law, that's a basic effort of trying. Housing Accountability Act, the second unit law, um, you know, new streamlining provisions. Cities that are clearly demonstrating that they're making an attempt to do housing at appropriate income levels and also to do functional market rate housing um, could be perhaps the, the stick. So you get credit for trying. Um, I would agree with the whole issue regarding the production of funding in San Jose. We have a lot of uh, units that are permitted but can't seem to get over the gold line and actually be built because of uh, absorption, absorption issues. And so I think trying to find something, the balance of actually doing the housing and yet providing localities the flexibility to create their own types of programs that address the issues of how we get housing more housing in our cities uh, would be ideal because each city will approach whatever their problems are perhaps in a different way. And I guess I don't agree with uh, Amy that it's just a small and middle cities that have issues with transportation and infrastructure costs. And as I obviously, we feel like we have huge issues in infrastructure costs and being able to deploy resources. Uh, so we would look to incentives uh, that also reward uh, a range of cities because we each have our own unique challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, I think the general premise of conditioning transportation funds to try to incentivize more housing production is the right um, thinking and so I just want to highlight that. I think that that's part of what we have to do. What I've heard in some of the comments though is that this may be a bit blunt and perhaps we need a bit more of a surgical approach in terms of to the public speaker's comment about um, there is a will to try uh, what's going wrong. Um, why are we, what are these cities needing from MTC, others, all of us, frankly, to, to make some of these conditions work. And I'm not sure that we understand what those dynamics are uh, in certain jurisdictions. So I think that that would be helpful. And I know we're getting to um, the end of time, so I just wanted to, to uh, comment about some of the um, public speakers that we heard from in terms of process. This is actually something that I mentioned very early on, which is a 
community engagement and organizing element of the CASA process. I actually think it's really important to make sure that we are engaging not only constituents at this table, but folks who are all already working on these issues. I think it's going to be really difficult for CASA's recommendations to be um, implemented if we don't have an inclusive process on the front end. So I think it's really important to prioritize. And if that's through figuring out opportunities for others to participate in the work groups, if that's the format, cool. If not, how do we have a parallel strategy that is engaging folks who are very much committed to this, to this work? And then just lastly about process, I think maybe Michael or someone said, you know, we need to break down silos in this process. I actually think it's more building bridges across silos that give opportunities for our electeds, us who have constituencies. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about very low and uh, moderate income folks. Homeless folks are also in the continuum of care. Um, and so we may not break them down, but looking at the unintended consequences and finding out ways where people can actually lean in, I think may be a more effective strategy in terms of how we actually get some of the work done. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, I think those were really good closing comments and I, I think I, mean, I think capturing a lot of what we heard relative to this particular issue seems like a good idea, but tread carefully and be aware of unintended consequences. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, <coughs> excuse me, so we can do the wrap up. So I just want to uh, uh, take a few minutes and talk about next steps um, uh, and, and the October meeting. So the October meeting is on Wednesday the 25th at noon here, so I want everybody to know that. Uh, what will be on the agenda is we will um, you know, digest all the feedback we've had uh, today. Again, please leave me your packages. Uh, we'll organize this. We'll sort through the work groups and we'll start to work on work group logistics um, and there's a lot of work to be done in that that we need to think through. Um, the, the second thing and I want to uh, give uh, Carol Guante a few minutes is that we're going to begin in October to bring in our research partners so the staffing team for this effort is the MTC staff, uh, my firm and, and UC Berkeley. Uh, and Carol, if you maybe would just take a minute or two and talk both about the Turner Center and the Urban Displacement uh, Project. And again, we're going to be uh, bringing you guys into this process starting next month. Just wanted to give you a minute. Great, thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, first, I just want to introduce uh, David Garcia, who is a new policy director with uh, Turner Center, who will be working with me on what you'll hear from the Turner Center. Um, in October, and uh, sorry that uh, both Karen Chapel and Mary Zuck are not here from the Urban Displacement Project, but at least one of them will be here to present um, in October. And so the idea of uh, these two presentations is that we <clears throat> will provide some basically background information uh, from the Turner Center on the development process and um, the some of the issues that have come up in the production um, conversation so far today about just what does it cost uh, to produce housing in the Bay Area uh, and to the extent that we know and understand what are the drivers of those uh, costs. Uh, so just to try to do some educational level setting so that everybody has um, some baseline information so that as we look at how to pull different levers in the policy uh, front that we can see um, how those different policies um, interact with kind of the, the basics of the development costs and, and process. And then the Urban Displacement Project, uh, many of you know, has done a tremendous amount of work on um, where gentrification is occurring, where displacement is occurring, uh, but also some of the um, best practices, ideas uh, in terms of uh, how to uh, approach uh, some of those issues. And so they'll um, also be making a presentation. And we thought uh, it was good to try to have, even though it's a lot of presentation, and you all love to get in and you know engage at, at a deep level, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to do both of those things at the same time, just to, again, keep the balance of uh, these ideas in our heads um, contemporaneously as we um, dive into the uh, 
conversations. So we'll be doing that in October. Thank you, Carol. So again, the agenda for October, uh, bringing in the research team, working on the work groups, anything else that MTC has to update us on as we go through the process, and then uh, potentially some updates on the legislation. So that'll be the agenda as we know it today. And I'd just like to turn it over to the co-chairs to close us out.